In Orkney, we used to have an expression, I'll be hour with the moon, meaning that I will come and visit you when the moon is full to light my way. So it's a Friday afternoon. It certainly is. We're kind of snowed in mm. still. There's been an amazing amount of snow for Orkney in the past week. And we're sitting here having a wee bit of port. It's not port. There's no port in this at all. Oh, right. Sorry. It's mulled wine. We're sitting here having mulled wine. Mm. And it's already going to my head. It's got brandy in it. A lightweight. <laughs> 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 but you told me a story. In, in preparation for this Friday afternoon mm. <laughs> treat that I, I thought you might like to share. Well, I was just saying to Rhonda that, you know, it's three o'clock, Friday afternoon, and I asked if she'd heard of the Arna Magnuson Institute in Iceland, and she hadn't. And I said that they were part of the University of Iceland, and they were the keepers of the sagas. And the director in the past was a man uh, called Vestian Ullison. And Vestian and his wife Una stayed with me once. Um, long story, but they returned the, the favor. I stayed with them for a few nights in, in Iceland, won a visit there as well, and, and went to the Arna Magnuson Institute. And he said they had a tradition there that wherever they went in the world, they would buy a bottle of the local booze bring it back, and put it in a cupboard. And every day at three o'clock, they would have a drink. Oh, every day? Every every Sorry. Friday. Okay. Sorry. Did I say every day? I meant every, you said every day. Ah, every Wish Friday <laughs> at three o'clock, they would then select something from the cupboard, and they would all have a drink, and they'd all just gather together, have a drink, have a chat, have a laugh. Brilliant way to run an organization, I think. It is. And um, so this is my homage to the Arnold Magnuson Institute. And while I was there, actually, I had the incredible privilege. I mean, to me, this is like, you know. A religious experience. Oh, I think much more important than that. Um, I was taken into the vault of the Arnold Magnuson Institute. And Vestian said, right, what can, I, what can we find here? And he brought down this uh, a box and he opened it. And he brought out a book, a beautiful medieval manuscript written on vellum, you know, which is uh, calf skin. And uh, said, there you go, you know. So I was holding this book and I said, what, what is this? And he said, Flatty Arbok. And I said, Flatty Arbok, but that's... Uh, that's on this, that's this, what date? I said, what date is this? And he said it was 1360 something. And I said, well, that's quite early for a copy. And he said, it's not a copy. This is Flatty Art Book. And I won't tell you what went through my head because we decided not to not swear on, on a podcast. Um, but I was, I was kind of like in shock and awe. And I said, but it's on display out there in the museum. And he said, it's in two volumes. Ah, and this is the saga where, which contains Orkney Inga saga. It's where our Orkney Inga saga comes from, is excerpts brought together in that book, which was written in Iceland in the 14th century to be given to the king um, of Denmark, um, who then, you know, I thought was really bad man, or she went and bloody died. So they never got it. <laughs> and it was found by the aforementioned Arna Magnuson, who was collecting for the king of Denmark in the 18th century, 
on on the island of Flatoy, which is the same as our Flotta, Flat, Flat Island, and um, and brought it back, and and then it was transferred back to Iceland. I think it was nineteen sixty one. All the, the sagas went back from the royal collection. And to me, holding the original Orkney Angus saga was just the most amazing experience. I'm havering. Why don't we just start and actually do what we were supposed to be doing instead of just going off at a tangent? Well, it does lead in, actually, to explaining who we are and what this is all about. Who am I? Well, there's a question. Uh, my name's Tom Muir. And I'm a storyteller, writer, museum-y person, worked in archaeology, history, folklore. Um, Arcadian. Yep, very Arcadian. Apart from my great-granny who came from Fair Isle, which is part of Shetland. But otherwise, uh, born on a small farm called Valdegar, down by the sea. And... Uh, in 1963, so farm boy, no qualifications whatsoever. I just do what I do because I love it. And you are? And I am Rhonda Moore, your wife. I come from uh, Western New York State in America, which if you talk to anyone from Western New York, don't say upstate because that's two different things. Because you get upset. <laughs> Western New York. This is reminding me actually very much this week of Western New York with all the snow. I, I used to have sort of a traumatic experience driving to work in the middle of the night in snowstorms. And so I, I was glad to see the back of that particular part of Western New York. We get a lot of snow there and a lot of storms. But that's where I spent the first 50 years of my life in a, a very small town and Moved around a little bit within a five mile radius of that small little town, South Dayton, it was called. And well, it's a long story and I won't go into it all, but Tom and I met when I was doing some research for a book that I wanted to write at a very difficult time in my life. And I wanted it to be a fantasy naturally. And I had always loved the, the selfie stories and kind of tracked them down to Orkney and found out about Orkney and eventually, after having looked through as many books as I could find as I could get through the interlibrary loan <laughs> from the little bookmobile that used to come to our town every, every other week, um, I still had some questions and so I drummed up the courage to contact the Orkney Library and Archive and they were extremely helpful and lovely. And then they sent me to Tom by email for more answers to my questions about folklore. And so Tom and I had a little bit of a back and forth for mm -hmm. a few months. Mm -hmm. And then that was about what, 2002 two or three or so, years yeah. from now. Mm. And that was it. And then about 13 years later, <laughs> my, my last child, I had four children that I had to raise on my own. My last child was off to college and I was starting to consider what I might like to do. I had got uh, I had got a Bachelor of Science in Human Development and was taking a little break or wanted to take a little break to come and travel somewhere and I decided to come to Orkney. So I got back in touch with Tom by Facebook and sent him a message and, and that's how we got back in contact in about 2014 was it? It was June 2014. It was in the 20s, as I seem to remember. <laughs> but, I mean, the book that you were writing, I think people would like to hear more about, about that and also maybe a wee bit about the circumstances as well because you're talking about driving and snowstorms in the middle of the night, which is something that we would be reluctant to do around here because we don't have that normal weather pattern. But... <laughs> uh, but would you like to elaborate on that, or, or would you not? Well, a lot of it is on our website, uh, orkneology.com, but basically I had a, a very bad marriage and had to leave with my four children and um, had to go very unprepared 
back to work. So I, I could only get sort of menial jobs. And uh, eventually I did get a what they call a state job in America, which is a better paying job and, you know, with retirement and things like that. But it, it was a long drive and I had to leave my children, which was the very thing that I did not want to do. And so it, it was just a really rough time for quite a few years, which is why I started writing the story. Mm. Self-preservation. Yes. I needed yeah. an artistic outlet. I needed, I needed to be able to create some hope for myself. Mm. And so through the years, I, I did finish the story, by the way, it, it became a book and I did shop it around a little bit and got some interest and but I couldn't let it go. I just, I don't know why. I still haven't, but I will soon. Mm -hmm. But um, through the years, I would peek in online on Orkney and what was going on there. And sometimes I would peek in on this nice man, Tom Muir, who had helped me. Bloody stalker. <laughs> <laughs> and it was always sort of a sweet dream that there was such a lovely place, <clears throat> lovely people in it. And I never really thought I would be able to travel there, but... Um, years later, I did, I did begin to find the courage that I might want to and be able to travel somewhere. And here's a funny story to interject. I mean, I'm going to skip over all the sad stuff for now. When I did get down to wanting to travel to Orkney and thinking that I could, there's a man called Rick Steves who does a travel program in America. And <laughs> I have watched him for years and and I had actually ordered a DVD, which is, you know, all you could, in those days, there wasn't streaming or things like that, uh, about European travel tips, because I didn't know how to travel and I was scared to, but I thought I would like to try to learn. And so I watched the Rick Steves video and all of his, his programs on PBS and I loved Rick. Well, fast forwarding many years later, Tom and I are married, I'm living in Orkney, and who should have an appointment with Tom at the museum to get some information about Orkney from him? But Rick Steves! <laughs> who i never heard of. Tom had never heard of him, but I was just squealing like a fangirl. And so I went to work with him that day. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll bring your, your children to work. So <laughs> bring your wife to work. So I happened to be there when Rick came in <clears throat> to talk to Tom. But anyway, that's that's a little sample of how my life has changed, and I think that's enough for now. We got together. We mm -hmm. maybe you want to say more about it. Uh, well, I mean, life for me is kind of weird. I've been working at the Orkney Museum since 1988, so it's 30. Well, we're into the 36th year now. And one of the things that I do is outreach, so I work with the media. So if anybody is doing a newspaper or magazine article or a radio show or television, they contact me for the information up front. And I'm, I know that I'm the BBC's go-to guy in um, Orkney because I was told that once and I had never heard the expression before. <laughs> I had no bloody idea, but I mean, I could guess. I'm not an idiot, you know. Um, I didn't know there was such thing as go-to guys, but anyway, they phone me. I give them information. I also suggest people that they should talk to, and also locations to film art as well. And uh, and a lot of times they say, well, "Would you come and do something?" So I go along. So I've I've met a lot of celebrities along the years, and I mean, to me, a celebrity is just a person that kind of got got lucky, mm. you know. Um, not taking anything away from them, but I am not in awe of people who are famous at all. No. doesn't matter who the hell they are. They're just another human being as far as I'm concerned. When we first started talking online, before we actually decided that we were a couple, Tom used to tell me about people that he knew. You know, I would mention somebody and he'd say, oh, I know that guy, or I've met him. Or, no, you don't. Cut it out. And he had, and he would send me a clip of a, of a program or something to prove it. And so later on, well, very recently, as a matter of fact, 
there was another man, a Navajo flute player called R. Carlos Nakai that I had always loved. And I had his CDs in a shop, a gift shop that I used to run in South Dayton. And I put some music on one night and Tom said, oh, who's that? And I said, it's, you wouldn't know him. He's a, he's a flute player called R. Carlos Nakai. And, and Tom said, oh, I think I know him. I said, you do not. But guess what? He did. <laughs> he didn't know him. Our Carlos had come into the museum looking for him to talk about shapeshifter stories. Mm -hmm. He was interested in selkies too, you see. Lovely guy. He was here with his family, with his wife and his daughter and son-in-law, who Will Clipman, who was a drummer and storyteller as well. So, so that's just kind of how our life goes now. <laughs> and mm. How Tom's life has always gone. Mm. Things, things just happen. And as a result, we have many interesting friends. And mm. I think that's kind of what we want to do with this podcast is to talk to as many interesting people as we can. And Yeah. Them. Well, I mean, our Carlos and his wife and daughter and son-in-law are coming back to Orkney later this year. And so hopefully we'll be able to have a chat with them then if, if they're up for it. I mean, I haven't asked yet. Uh, so it's a bit presumptuous, I suppose. <laughs> but um, um, but yeah, they're they're wanting to kind of go around Orkney with me and get a flavour of the place and, and an understanding of the people. And I think that is a very important thing. People are very important everywhere, wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And I think getting an understanding of the people of Orkney is kind of what we're doing. Mm. with the website and also with some of the books that we're publishing. Mm. I mean, I've been very fortunate in, with storytelling that it's, it's taken me around the world, you know, from uh, from Nunavut in, in what was, I think, the north, uh, was it Northwestern Territories or something like that? It used to be called in, in Canada. But Nunavut is now the um, the, the land that, is belongs to the Inuit, so it's their ancestral lands, and it has been given back to them rather generously by the Canadian government. I'm being sarcastic, by the way, in case you didn't get. Uh, you know, no. Here, have your have your own <laughs> land back. Gee, thanks. Um, but but then again, there are many Indigenous people who are not treated so well. So I'm not having a pop at the. Mm -hmm. Canadian government, in case any Canadians are feeling insulted. Mm -hmm. Not in the slightest. No, we love Canadians. They're some of our favourite people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's so it's taken me from Nunavut to Hong Kong and, um, and many, many countries in between. So I've been very lucky, but whenever I go to another country, I want to know about how people live. I'm not interested in celebrities or royalty or, you know, I'm the very interesting as well and, and nothing, you know, I'm not setting up a guillotine or nothing, but, you know, I just I want to know how people live because I'm an ordinary person. I want to know how other ordinary people live. And uh, so that's, and I also want to try out all the local foods and everything like that as well. Can't understand this abroad thing where, you know, people go to Spain and they want to have fish and chips and watch EastEnders at the time it comes on TV in Britain mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, you know, you're missing the point. Yeah. I guess the American version of that would be wanting to find a McDonald's. Hmm. Which you <laughs> would have forbid. which you would have no trouble with. <laughs> I have encountered quite a lot of those in my travels as Although well. Although I have over to world. say, we don't have any in Orkney. Yet. No, we don't have any of the big brands in Orkney. <laughs> so this is our introductory. It's not really a podcast, it's just an introduction to who we are and what we would like to be doing with this podcast. Mm. And it will develop and it will improve. We're, we're, mm. we're still struggling trying to figure out the equipment and everything. And, and I had to get um, sort of half drunk in order to be able to record <laughs> this. So you lightweight. That will improve as well. <laughs> but we just wanted to, to introduce ourselves mm. and say we're, we're looking forward to a lot of Yeah, but we've, we've only done half of this already. We've only done half the story. Oh. Mm. Because you left it at we got back in touch 
in 2014, dot, dot, dot. That's true. I did leave it rather hanging. Mm. Well, we did, we did begin to talk by email because it had more room than Facebook messages. And then we decided with great trepidation on my part to, to talk. And I was, I was nervous because I didn't think I had a very nice voice and Tom has such a lovely voice. <laughs> You know, I am so sick, fed up with people talking about my voice. He hates voice. it, but no, I it is really <laughs> pisses me off. Nevertheless, anyway. when we did start actually talking, he didn't mind my voice at all, and it wasn't the so slightest. bad. So. <laughs> I mean, I knew you were American, so yes. I could kind of guess that you might have an American <laughs> accent, you know. So we started talking, and then, uh, well, obviously, we fell in love, and... One thing led to another, and well, I think we probably should explain that. I mean, we got writing to each other, just bantering on Facebook to start with. Um, I got a friend request from her one Sunday afternoon when I had my feet up in front of the telly watching highlights from Glastonbury Rock Festival and well, music festival, um, I should say. Because uh, it covers many genres, and uh, I was sort of chugging my way through four bottles of whiskey. Enough eh, wine. Wine. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, maybe you should edit that. But <laughs> <laughs> I was chugging my way through four bottles of wine and uh, just watching, like I said, the highlights from Glastonbury. And I got a friend request from this woman who I thought was a bit too good looking to be true, and. Um, I mean, not that, you know, my being friends on Facebook means that you have to be look a certain way. I mean, obviously not. But I had been getting a lot of, you know, um, friend requests from teenage girls in like Austin, Texas, who must have been quite poor because they didn't seem to have much money to buy clothes with because <laughs> they weren't wearing very much. And you know how teenage girls hate social media, you know, so you'd get a, a girl there who had have 10 friends on Facebook and they were all middle-aged men and four of them lived in Kirkwall, <laughs> which is the town in, in Orkney where I used to live. And so it was like, uh-huh, delete. And, uh, and then Rhonda popped up and I thought, wow. And, uh, so I just sent a message saying, look, you know, who are you? Because I checked them. Like I always do, I check the, the site to see if it's legit or if the person is just like a fake account uh, with nothing on it. And so it seemed genuine enough. So I just said, like, do I know you? And uh, and then you got back pretty much straight away. Yeah, it was kind of frightening to me because I was just sending you a message thinking, I'll just sort of, because I could see he had about a thousand friends. So <laughs> among that crew, I was sure I could just lurk for a while and, and maybe pick up some information. I was I was still at that time thinking about coming to Orkney and knew that I couldn't afford to stay in a proper bed and breakfast or anything. And, you know, I, I just had thought that he might have some advice on what, where I could stay and what I should see and things like that in a very short period of time. And so when he got right back to me, it was a little bit frightening because I, I had planned to lurk. But that's where it began. And, and I told him who I was and that we had been in contact before, many years before. And he actually remembered me, which surprised me. <laughs> I have to confess that the reason I remembered you is because of a Beach Boys song. Yeah. It's the only oh, Rhonda yeah. that I'd ever heard of, you it's see. that song, yep. I, um... I just thought it's four o'clock here. It's four o'clock. <laughs> Kissing. That's our sleep Kissing clock on the mantelpiece. Uh, so, yeah, I was the only Rhonda that I ever actually heard of. But, I mean, I did remember writing back and forth. And we had a good laugh. I mean, there was, there was a rapport between us. Now, I get hundreds of requests for help, for information and all that throughout the year at the museum, everything from people doing degree courses to PhDs to research and books to, as I said, media and such like. Uh, and I don't remember them. I mean, people get back in touch and say, oh, you were very helpful last year and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, 
I actually have no idea who this person is. It's not because I don't care. It's just because there's so bloody many to choose from. But I did remember the, the fact that we did actually have a bit of a rapport going back and forth. Now, I had no idea who this woman was, obviously, at that time. This was on email long before uh, you could attach a photograph. Oh, could I just interject and say mm-hmm. I still had dial-up internet with a with a mm-hmm. what do you call it? A, there was a limit on how much I could use, and nobody could use the phone while we were on the computer. So it was ancient times, mm-hmm. and before social media, so you had no idea what anybody looked like. Uh, so for all I knew, she could be a you know, happily married ninety-five-year-old woman, you know, and uh, and it didn't. Make, make any difference to me because it was just somebody asking for advice for help and I will always give uh, help whenever I can so but yeah I did remember you know, but we were talking I think it started off just like right into each other on Facebook and then you said oh you seem to be chatty like me so you gave me your email address and then we emailed and then we ended up on Skype I think it that's was. right it was skype yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's how we got in touch but yeah we would talk on skype and it ended up being every night and it ended up being about four hours every night <laughs> so it wasn't as if it was just like you know sort of quick chat or anything I mean, no and the more we started talking to each other the more we just we just it, it, it felt like we were the other half of each other's soul you know the the person that you long for when you look up at the moon at night and oh this is sounding very sappy but we both knew but it was ridiculous mm-hmm. so <laughs> we didn't say it mm-hmm. because it was impossible mm. um, but then actually it wasn't we we did make it happen it was was not without a few tears you know it's it's always difficult to leave one thing in order to mm. go to another and in this case the one thing was my family and my home where I lived for the first 50 years of my life and the people I love. But that's the way life is. It was a, it was a big <laughs> ask. I mean, I did say that I would go to America if that's, what it, if that's what it would take. But I mean, it was just we had to be together. Just the thought of you in America um, makes me laugh. Well, I'd have probably been shot during the, <laughs> the Trump <laughs> period. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, because I can be a bit vocal in my criticism of politics, but, you know. Well, we won't talk about that here. Uh, no, no, I think best not. But um, anyway, I mean, the fact that we spoke for so long every night without actually being in the same room meant that we basically knew everything about each other because it was just Talking. conversation. Mm-hmm. There was no nothing physical, obviously, and um, so we just talked and we got to know each other so well that we just, I mean, I just thought she was absolutely amazing and incredibly brave from what you had gone through, you know, with being abandoned and, and just having to raise up a family and everything and, and doing it with such grace and style. I was really just, I can't tell you how, you are my hero. In life, actually. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, and it's not the amount of brandy I added to the mug wine. No, seriously. I mean, it's it's it was quite incredible. So, I really value truth and honesty. Honesty is, is something that I really value. And truth is becoming a bit of a thing of the past these days. You know, when you look at the media and politics and such like, you know, telling lies is just considered acceptable. It can be a bit discouraging. Uh, <laughs> rather. But if I was to try to tell Rhonda that I was the Earl of Orkney and I lived in a castle somewhere and, you know, and just basically bullshit you, I'd never be able to keep it up because we spoke for four hours every night. You're gonna make a slip up in that time. <laughs> so it was not it wasn't difficult to be honest and tell the truth, but but you had to. So we knew so much about each other. 
you know, um, without actually having met. And uh, I, I was smitten, but realizing that, you know, he, there was an, a, an ocean between us. Yeah. So we didn't really speak about that. We were just talking. But then one morning I woke up and, of course, raced to the computer to see if Tom had sent me anything <laughs> the night before. And it was two songs that could only be interpreted as love songs. And that changed everything because he had actually confessed that he was falling in love with me. And I knew I felt the same. And so then we had to decide, you know, how, if we could do this. And yes, we, we did do it. It was, it was quite painful <laughs> at times, but, but we did do it. And I should just backtrack slightly and say that the, the Selkie story, the, the, the book I was writing all those years ago, I had set it at a place called Rackwick, um, which is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And when I came here to visit Tom for the first time, when we actually met, um, he took me there for my birthday, for my 50th birthday, actually. Mm -hmm. And on the sand, on the pink beach of Rackwick, where all the striped boulders were tossed about and Oh, it was so beautiful. He proposed to me on my 50th birthday on that very beach where I had set my story all those years ago. And I don't know, that that was just <laughs> well done. <laughs> ah, <clears throat> well, there's more to it than that. You see, Orkney was voted the most romantic place in the world by That's Milson right. Boone Reader <laughs> several years ago, which made us all chuckle. But you just uh, put it off <clears throat> the charts with that. Well... <laughs> During one of the many long hours of conversations that we had had with each other, um, you had spoken about a ring that you had when you were a kid mm -hmm. at, at high school. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, a class ring for Americans. Right. Uh, does that mean classy? <laughs> no. <laughs> But it was uh, a gold band with uh, a green, well, stone. Pretend but, emerald. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was <laughs> probably glass, but paste. But it was, in your mind, it was an emerald ring. And uh, you, you had this, this uh, class ring, but it, uh, it had got broken. And so... Uh, I had stored away this information in the back of my little dyslexic brain because I, I remember things. And uh, so I, I had a ring made uh, with an emerald and uh, that was what I brandished on the beach. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was in the place where Rhonda's book was set. And so I... How could she refuse? How could I indeed? Yes. And so here we are, eight years later. <laughs> mm -hmm. More than Nine years, years later, yeah. actually, eight. because that was... Um, 2015. 2015. And we've had many, many wonderful adventures together since then. But that'll, also, be, that'll be nine years, actually, on no. the... Uh, yeah, nine years this summer. Oh, this, this summer, yeah. This July. <laughs> We've had many, many adventures <clears throat> together since then. And, you know, like everybody's lives, we have good days and bad days and difficult things to handle. And, I mean, I, I always feel like, because I, I wrote a little ebook about moving to Orkney and trying to help people who were considering such a move, because it is kind of a, a big deal, even if you live in the UK to begin with, much less if you have to deal with immigration and all of, all of that stuff. It's not easy just to uh, to move continents because there's a hell of a lot of legal work and expense as well. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, working at the museum, I I did actually earn enough to be able to uh, to qualify. I mean, the government was recently talking about putting it up to 
Oh. Was it 60,000 a year he had to earn? And Several it's like, times more than it who was. Who the <laughs> hell earned 60,000 a year? You know, mm. To them, it was like peanuts. Mm. But to a, to a, a working guy here, it's, it's, it's unreachable. It's not, it's not easy to, to go through the whole immigration process. But even if you live in the UK, it's not easy to live on an island where uh, there are a lot of inconveniences that you might not realize. And the weather is very different and it's very dark in the winter and very light in the summer, which actually annoys me. But, um, but it might be worth it. It might be worth it. Yeah. It was worth it for me. I've never, ever regretted, regretted this move. Me neither. And I mean, you were saying that, you know, we've had our ups and downs like everybody in the world has, anybody in a relationship. But the ups and downs has just been, you know, trials and tribulations of life that you have to get through. Mm -hmm. Not a problem with each other. Mm -hmm. Just everyday life as it is, mm -hmm. lived by humans. Mm -hmm. But then Rhonda had the idea of coming up with uh, Orneology.com, a combination of sort of a website about the experience of somebody from outside Orkney moving in and also then historical, archaeological, folklore pieces from me, um, from somebody very deeply rooted here. Uh, but it's kind of ended up becoming a, more of an archive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's 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 chosen the shape it wants to be and has to be. Mm -hmm. and and we're just going with it. <laughs> which is, yeah, we're just trotting along behind it. It's, and this it's, part of it, this this podcast is another way that we want to collect. I guess I don't know. That's that. I don't really like that word. It sounds a little bit imperialistic. It's a bit, it's a bit clinical. Yeah, but but this is a, a way that we can help to make a record of how life is here and uh, interesting people that pass through here mm -hmm. or live here. Mm -hmm. and There's a lot of people that uh, plan to interview. <laughs> of course, they don't know this They yet. don't know it yet, but they'll <laughs> but be they delighted. <laughs> well, if not, I have enough blackmail material to be able to <laughs> persuade them. But, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's, I've been very fortunate in life, having a very unusual life, but then meeting so many amazing people with amazing stories. And it's just wanting to pay tribute to them, really, mm. and, uh, and have some of these stories recorded for posterity as well as anything else. Mm. Because there is the possibility of actually just archiving uh, these recordings as well so that they're in the public domain at some stage or other. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves here a bit. We have big plans, but we hope that you'll you'll stay with us and um, and hope you enjoy it because yes. it's just kind of. And for all those people that are going to be getting in touch, saying what was the song that I sent Rhonda? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an old 1980s song by Chris Isaacs called Wicked Game. And there was a beautiful version done by London Grammar. And it was done live for a, a radio show, and you'll find it online. And they, they, for anyone that, well, for those that, that don't know about London Grammar, there's a three-piece band. There's a keyboard player, a guitarist, and a woman with the most amazing, beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is so emotional. And it's so stripped back, this version. It's so simple. Uh, and it's all about falling in love, but not wanting to fall in love. Mm -hmm. But you can't help yourself. That was the card up my sleeve. <laughs> the ace tucked up there, you know. So if you've stayed with us for this long, thank you for your patience. And I know, well done. <laughs> <laughs> give, you, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> this is just a practice run. Future ones will be much more polished, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, I hope not. Yes. No, you're right. You're right. We don't want to be polished no. and slick. We want to be real and we want to just yeah. talk with 
our friends. Yeah, because we're just having a conversation with, with friends. Yeah. It's not. It's not like a kind of, you know, back in the old days in the BBC where they, when they read the news, they had to wear an evening suit, <laughs> you know, black tie and tails. This is the BBC. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's not good. Nah. So, anyway, thank you again, folks. And take care and stay warm and be good to each other. Yeah.